Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Earthly Headlines. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Torrid Meteor uh, Swarm or Stream, and it's this ongoing investigation and study about the, its potential risk. Now you guys have heard of the Tunguska event, I've talked about it a bunch of times. It, it was an event that happened in 1908, in, uh, named after the region that this meteor fell from the sky and flattened a huge swath of land. I'm talking about like a city-sized swath of land in Siberia. And it flattened all the trees. And um, that allegedly came from this torrid uh, stream here. And the reason why they call it the torrids is because it, from if you look at it from the sky, it looks like it's coming from the, uh, the constellation of Taurus. Even though that's not the case, that's just where the name comes from. And that's typically how they name these different uh, meteor streams, like the Perseids look like they're coming from Perseus, and so on. The meteor stream, or we, the Earth passes through this meteor stream twice a year, and it happens in the fall. And that is possibly where the where Halloween originated. Uh, October thirty first is if you go deep into lore and and different cultures uh, i forget the name but there's this i think the 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 native american culture that was around uh modern day new mexico and arizona i forget their name but they i think they have a tradition as well as other tribes that something bad happened along the lines of like a serpent coming down and hitting the earth and uh, destroying a bunch of stuff uh, which parallels that of some sort of extra, not extraterrestrial, well, uh, well, yeah, it's some extraterrestrial object that came through the Earth's atmosphere and hit the Earth and caused all kinds of destruction. And this story is paralleled in a bunch of different cultures, and that is possibly the origin comes from this Torrid meteor stream. So exactly uh, where does this thing come from, and why is it on this orbit that it is, and why do we pass it every year? They're not sure, but they think that it's a part of a, it's a bunch of particles from this comet called Enki, which they believe came from this thing called the Oort Cloud, which is way beyond the Kuiper Belt. And these are the remnants of that, uh, that one huge object. So anyway, um, let's get to the study. So the study from Western University posits proof to the possibility that an oncoming swarm of meteors may indeed pose an existential risk for us, the inhabitants of Earth. So um, this torrid meteor stream might be the, the cause of the Younger Dryas event and possibly a bunch of other events as well. And just like clockwork, if this is true, if, if everything about these orbits is true and that we pass through every year, then like clockwork, we should be able to predict when um, we'll get hit. Now, not predict to the precise day, but have an idea of where in rela of where we are, our position on the Earth, and where uh, which part of the um, this huge cluster that we're going to uh, uh, collide with. Um, now, you can see that there's colors here. Um, so the ones in blue and green are ones that aren't as big of a threat, but the ones in orange, yellow, and red are higher risk NEOs or near earth objects. So there are two main sources of near earth objects so far. Uh, asteroids, meteoroids, interlopers from the outer solar system, which are typically comets. Um, and over the past few decades, uh, scientists have cataloged more than 90% of the potentially hazardous NEOs and, the, and there's ongoing work to detect, catalog the uh, greater numbers because again, there's a lot of objects to take into consideration as we go on our or orbit around the sun because there's so much going on at any given time in our solar system that it's just we don't have enough manpower or resources to keep track of everything now our potential we could keep track of a lot but unfortunately there's not a lot of um, resources and there's not a lot of people on this task Although there are greater and greater numbers of people working on it because this is starting to gain momentum. But still, it's not where it needs to be if we want to be on top of um, 
on top of our not only covering our bases but also on top of any unforeseen circumstance that we can react uh, accordingly and perhaps take the proper measures to avoid another devastating common impact. So here's the the 1929 foot, uh, photo of the Tunguska damage. So this is about 21 years after the fact and still it's just obliterated. And I don't think anything still is living there. I think it's still uninhabitable. So you can understand the damage a, a near earth object could do. And it didn't even, there was no impact. It blew up in the atmosphere, but it just, the shockwave just leveled everything in a city-sized area. And if that happened in to on top of London or Chicago or whatever big city, LA, yeah, everyone's dead for sure. There, there, it wouldn't be in, in, inhabitable. And, and the Tung Tunguska comet or meteor, whatever the object was, was not that big. So anyway... Uh, the torrid storm is a third potential source of risk that changes the probabilities of possible catastrophic impacts. Um, the Tunguska explosion is considered a one in 1,000 year event, assuming random distribution of events over time. Um, the torrid storm, which is a dense cluster within the torrid meteor stream. And if you think about the stream, it's like a, think of it like a highway. It's just like this literally a stream of a bunch of objects passing through. And then every once a year or so, yeah, yeah. Once every year, there's a huge cluster that goes through it, and we cross that uh, we we cross that cluster um, every year. So, as we pass through the stream every year, it changes the odds significantly and gives a possible reason for the unlikely occurrence that a once per one thousand year event occurred just over a century ago. So basically, they are hypothesizing that um, the Torrid meteor swarm. Its mere existence heightens the possibility of a cluster of large impacts over a short period of time. And that's what the Younger Dries event was. It was a cluster of impacts, um, two bursts of it. So uh, melt, Meltwater Pulse 1A and 1B are the direct uh, result of those uh, cluster of impacts. So the Torrid Meteor Stream has long been this suspect, I guess, of, of I guess, victimizing the Earth for so long. Um, so anyway, there's a simulation. So there's a simulated, uh, let's see who it is. Peter Brown, Paul Wiegert, uh, David Clark. They're all part of this team that simulated a large collection of 100 meter diameter meteoroids, like the one triggered the 1908 Tunguska event with orbits similar to the Torrid swarm and calculated their positions forward for a thousand years. So by analyzing each object's position over time, the astronomers calculated two optimal viewing times and telescope pointing locations for the Torrid Swarm to properly investigate its overall risk potential. So they pinpointed the best time. So if you guys like to go camping, especially in the desert where it gets really dark, but, um, but if you have altitude, then you can see the, cl the stars clearly. Like Joshua Tree is a good place if you live in uh, SoCal. Um, it, you should go at these times just to see all the fireballs in the air, and it's amazing. It's worth the price of admission, if at all. I mean, the price is so, it's like 20 bucks to get in, or even that. Sometimes, if you go in late, you can get in for free, as long as you leave early the next morning. Uh, but anyway, there's this awesome video that visualizes this, and I want to show you guys this now. So, here's the Earth orbiting around the sun, and you can see this huge gang of near-earth objects here the, the this torrid cluster and we pass right through it and you can see right here the colors are different so the ones in the red are obviously the ones closest to the earth and pose the biggest risk and the ones further away pose the least amount of risk but the point that see how the earth is crossing this well it, in this uh visual in this particular example we went through uh a little bit not toward the center we were more toward the side here but each year is different we in 1975 that was the year that we were closest to the center of the debris which obviously heightens the prob probability that we'll get hit with something uh not 2019 is the year that since 1975 that we're the closest to the center and we won't be this close to the center until the twenty, the year twenty thirty or so. 
So what that means is, yeah, higher risk, but also it's better viewing for uh, um, shooting, quote, shooting stars, comets, meteors, all that stuff in the sky. So again, it makes if you're if you're big on that, then this is the season to do it. Uh, according to Western Meteor Physics Group data analysis, the Earth will approach within 30 million kilometers of the center of the Tord swarm this summer, the closest such encounter since 1975. The calculations show that this will be the best viewing times until the 2030s. And then this is what David Clark says. There has been great interest in the space community since we shared our results at the Planetary Defense Conference in Washington. Um, there is strong meteoric and NEO evidence supporting the Tord stream, uh, swarm and its potential potential existential risk but this summer brings a unique opportunity to observe and quantify these objects um so yeah so this they're having planetary defense conferences and this this should be a bigger thing because this could be a world ender if there's a world ender it'll be from the torrid stream or something like it so this planetary defense conference sounds ridiculous, but it's actually the right course of action to take, especially if you're in a country like the United States where we have the we have the benefit of being the top power in the world. And we have kind of a responsibility if we become aware of this as a nation to keep the earth in check. And the reason why I think it's a responsibility is because we're the only ones that could do take measures to be on the lookout for something like this and we have the resources to possibly prevent something as long as we know enough time beforehand that it's coming so for instance if we see something within three weeks or even 10 days of and we know it's going to hit us that's probably not enough time and if we prepare accurately and we put enough the idea is anyway if, is if we prepare accurately and have enough resources into developing technology personnel and and such to find all all of these near-earth objects faster and more efficiently then maybe that those 10 days notice could turn into 10 years or even five years either way that's something that's some time to work with to where we can prepare for either the impact or prepare technology to to move the 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 impactor or the object away a safe enough distance to where it'll just miss us. So um, that's the idea anyway. And no measures have been taken or very little have been taken since we developed the technology to see far off distances in space. So it's good that uh, guys like David Clark are not only raising awareness, but putting visuals together like this one and raising awareness to the importance of this because this is an existential threat that's not bullshit that could very well happen and it nearly happened in 1908 and it could happen again very soon so and if you look at gobekli tepe it seems like they were warning about something like this and the torrid meteor stream does seem like to a civilization that we knew were had their eyes on the skies based on a bunch of things like the pyramids and the alignment to Orion, the Orion correlation and Gobekli Tepe and other megalithic sites that were aligned with the cosmos in some way, that means that they were look they were a civilization looking at the sky. So if they were looking at the sky, then they must have noticed something like the Torrid Meteor Stream, and they must have noticed that things were falling out of the sky at that time. And that's why it's so important to pass on a lot of that information. It probably was important to them back in ancient, in the remote past to, to almost remind the generations afterwards, their descendants, whether it's through allegorical stories or through art or cave art or anything that they could to, to send that message that, hey, what, not only are we on earth, and not only could we grow things and create civilization and create religions, but we're also on a place that's susceptible to to bombardment from these these objects that are out in our solar system, but not not of the Earth. And with that message, um, I think they probably thought it very prudent to 
make sure that idea was ubiquitous in their culture, whether, again, it was through megaliths or through um, oral tradition or, or re religion or whatever it was, there were messages that they wanted to send to us. And it, it does seem like now we're starting to catch on and it's very encouraging. So anyway, let me know what you guys think about this. Younger Dryas, extraterrestrial NEOs, whatever it is, existential risk of, of the Earth. Anything you know about the Torrid Meteor Stream or other Meteor Streams or the Oort Cloud, let me know in the comments. The comments have been awesome lately and I think we're starting to get more traction. So like, share, su subscribe, it really helps. And we're coming up on 150 episodes, so I'm very excited about that. So yeah, um, that should do it, and I'll talk to you guys later.